Um, so today I will kind of speak about how I attempt to really find and discover emergent dynamical structure across conscious states. And I will hopefully explain this as I go and it will make more sense. But this kind of means that my work is in general grounded in emergence. Oh, nice, it's working. So I think maybe first a primer on emergence is quite useful here to bolster some intuition. The question arises, I think, what do we actually mean when we talk about emergence? And here is a kind of vast simplification, but I think quite a useful one. Can I use the cursor here? Oh, I can't see this is, uh, yeah, yeah, but for me as well, this would be useful. Well, ah, uh, to the right. Too. Here, so hmm. ah, nice. Okay. Okay. So here, what I really want to kind of explain, whoop, let's see if this works. Yeah, we can think about emergence really as some kind of emergence of novel properties on the macroscopic scale that are not reducible to the microscopic scale. Okay, or we can, whoop, there we go. Um, we can consider the emergence of collective dynamics. And this is something that I focus on more and I'll make this a little bit clearer. So this is the notion that there is no new property on the macroscopic scale, but the collective dynamics exhibit new dynamical laws. I think this is an important distinction. And in general, here is something that I just briefly offer is that operational measures capture these different aspects of emergence. What I really focus on when I talk about emergence in this work is that of there we go, collective dynamics that actually appear to be independent processes in their own right. So the idea is that there is no new properties or information on the macroscopic scale, and that the, the, this is the emergence of new dynamical laws rather than new physical laws. And I think that's important because as you'll see, the measure is one of dimensionality reduction. And I hope that will make sense as we go on. So, Really, what this culminates in is quite a specific caveat that I have to really stress. So the main goal here is not only to capture the degree of emergence of a macroscopic variable or some macroscopic dynamics on some hierarchical or higher order scale, but also to capture what these dynamics are. And this is my kind of focus on dynamical structure. In this sense, that's what we are attempting to do capture dynamical structure on higher order scales. And I want to kind of be very clear here. I mean dynamical structure in two different ways, right? So first I want to know how dominant those emergent higher order dynamics are in relation to their own scale, which gives us a proxy of the dynamical structure at that scale. And this is something that can only be seen on the higher order scale. But also, is this concept of the localization of those higher order dynamics across the micro level constituents. And this gives us a notion of how localized the macroscopic dynamics are or how distributed they are across the parts that make up the system. So the approach we take to address this is by quantifying emergence through dynamical dependence of a macroscopic variable on the microscopic base. So the framework of dynamical independence and the reference is there. This is Lionel Barnett's and Anil Seth's uh, work where they developed this measure. Um, the measure of dynamical independence really attempts to minimize the information flow from the micro to the macro, which can be quantified by the transfer entropy. So within this framework, the higher the dynamical dependence, the less emergent the macroscopic is more dependent on the microscopic. The lower the dynamical dependence, the more emergent. And in general, what we're trying to do is minimize dynamical dependence to find the emergent N macro, where N stands for the spatial scale of the macroscopic variable. So in general, dynamical independence can be considered to capture dynamical closure or informational closure. 
So what I will first do is really explain this by construction nature and behavior of dynamical independence and then get into some data. So if we begin with a simple toy model to illustrate how dynamical independence works on a stochastic time series, some of you stochastic time series, all I mean is some randomness in the time series. Um, so this is a causal graph and it's derived from a vector autoregressive model with nine variables. You don't need to know what a vector autoregressive model is. Um, and we see that it is instantiated with a kind of prescribed connectivity. So what we want to do is find the emergent dynamical structure in this system. So here, this serves as our microscopic base. Oh, so for each n macro, I perform random optimization restarts of gradient descent, voila, and minimize dynamical dependence. So the left panels show the optimization runs converge to kind of different values. And this might be indicating that they converge onto different n macros. So I kind of confirm this. Let's go. Um, by constructing a similarity matrix, which are the right panels, that measure the subspace angles between the n macros from different runs. White cells here indicate that um, they indicate that the runs or the optimization runs end up at the same local minima or the same n macro, and the dissimilarity is quantified and shown by a darker color. When we look at this toy model, it seems that the different macroscopic variables are quite different. But when we go to empirical data, we see that this is graded. It's not so black and white. So hopefully that makes sense as we go forward. Voila. So next, we can kind of determine the dynamical structure of n macros by assessing their spatial localization. This is that second element of structure that I mentioned. And this figure illustrates two approaches that I take. And I'm sorry if some of the writing is very small. I pride myself in my figures and I don't like this one. <laughs> so this figure illustrates these kind of two approaches, one which is a group level approach. So this will pop up. Yep. Um, and the group level approach is illustrated by the histograms. And they indicate the subspace angle between node subsets and the n macro assessing the localization. So the same set of uh, the subset of similar dimensions to the macro. So they're subsets of five in comparison to a five macro. Um, this method kind of partitions the system to find the most emergent subset. So it emphasizes these physical boundaries, which I don't like in my work. I want to assess whether there is a distributed nature of microscopic parts contributing to the macro. So in essence, I like this single node level approach, which is shown in those causal graphs. And this allows us and gives us a degree to which each node is implicated in the dynamics of the macro. So let's look at some data. So here I apply this method to steady state EEG recordings of participants during wakeful rest, propofol, xenon and ketamine induced anesthesia and these data were then kind of source reconstructed and the dynamical dependence analysis or independence analysis was performed in the source space this is the atlas that i used for source reconstruction um, before diving kind of into the results i think even a quick refresher on how i assess dynamical dependence and this idea of structure or dynamical dominance of n macros at their respective scales might be quite useful so you've maybe seen this already so we compare the minimal dynamical dependence values obtained during all optimization runs across different conditions so for instance this figure um, should show that the gray condition has lower dynamical dependence than the green condition at the scale of n and this suggests that the macroscopic um, that the macroscopic variables on the higher order scale are more emergent in the gray condition than the green, okay? Because the dependence is lower. Second, to estimate the degree of dynamical structure, and this is a key part, we look at how dominant particular N macros are at their respective higher order scales. So we do this by comparing the similarity of macros, as I mentioned before, found across the optimization runs, and these start with randomized initial conditions. So if the similarity, again, measured by this subspace angle, is high, the similarity matrix will be white, something like this. The darker the color, 
indicates more dissimilarity. And here's what I meant by when we go to empirical data, there is a lot more gradedness between the similarity as opposed to the toy model. But now with this, hopefully we can get to some of the results across conditions. So what we found is that across higher order scales from two until nine, you can feel free to ask me why I went only up to nine. Um, but what we have found is that the macroscopic kind of hierarchical scale across all of these spatial scales is more emergent in propofol than wake, which is quite interesting. But interestingly, we see much more structure emerging in wake than in propofol. What you are seeing there is the rows of the macroscopic variables and the columns are individual uh, subjects. So with Xenon, we kind of see something quite similar as well. More emergent dynamics across higher order scales in Xenon, but more dynamical structure in Wake. Oh, let me, okay. However, I think when we observe, what we observe with ketamine is that there is less emergent dynamics across higher order scales as opposed to Wake. And then when we're examining the structure, on the other hand, there is some structure emerging in ketamine that replicates wake or that seems to parallel it. Ketamine shows fewer distinct macros than both probefall and Zen on there. There are more clusters. So now, if we plot the distribution of similarity matrices values across conditions, we can compare the CDFs of these distributions and we kind of observe these significant differences. And even in ketamine and wake, where the structures were similar, we do see structural differences. So I think this is becoming quite important to me. What I do later, and maybe if we get time, I will get to it, is I perform a better measure than just um, a CDF distribution thing. I, I want to look at the uh, gromov weisenstein distance between the matrices to actually keep the geometry of each of the matrices to get a better measure of structure. But as an interim summary, um, we see that there is more dynamical structure in wake than anesthetic conditions across higher order scales. Ketamine also shows some dynamical structure, which is interesting because conscious reports were actually collected when they emerged out of ketamine, affirmative conscious reports. While for propofol and xenon, they reported no um, consciousness under the anesthetic. So this begs the question for me, um, might dynamical structure be associated with conscious report? In our preliminary study shows that it is. And maybe because the dynamics are more dependent across scales, might this indicate the functional relevance of emergent macros to conscious reports? Um, I might skip this in order to get to something slightly more interesting, but this is the localization uh, aspect of structure where I project the macro back onto the microscopic scale to see which micro level regions contribute to my macros. Again, macros across the rows and subjects across the uh, columns. And what I see is actually that there isn't much difference. What I'm seeing is when I'm looking at it from a simple microscopic point of view, I don't see this difference in structure too much. There seems to be strange lateralizations and it seems to be quite distributed. I get this with propofol, much more with xenon and with ketamine as well. So as much as I would like to linger on this because I kind of like that this is an inconclusive result, um, I would like to get onto something else. So the summary really is here that dynamical structure is important and not just the quantifying this kind of degree of emergence and because it doesn't get at this underlying fundamental structure that underlies states of consciousness. We see that, that even though there is kind of these lower levels of emergence based on the dynamical independence framework, um, in wake and ketamine, there is much more structure on those higher order scales. And I think that's quite important. Um, here, higher order interactions might be more relevant to the system in wake than anesthesia. Well, and structure seems to be sensitive at that higher order scales to conscious report. 
and single region contributions to me remain inconclusive, but there, I believe there is a reason for this. To actually unfold the higher order structure and then to try and project it onto a microscopic scale seems to defeat the purpose of why you'd even want a new perspective on the dynamics or a macroscopic perspective. So, higher order interactions might not be amenable to single region interpretation. And what I do here, yes, five minutes. Oh, great. Okay. So here I unfold the full dynamical structure across sleep stages. So again, on EEG data, but what I do is do a pairwise interaction analysis with Granger causality and mutual information. So functional di directed functional connectivity and undirected functional connectivity. And then I unfold the same idea. So to offer a kind of full unfolding of the dynamical structure. So I worked with 81 electrodes um, or an 81 electrode EEG array with 71 of those being EEG electrodes across 29 participants in wakefulness N1, N2, N3 and REM sleep. After collecting the data, I did source reconstruction again to get the source time series. I then segment the data into epochs and fit either a VAR or a state space model. Again, you don't need to know what they are, but they just do exactly that. They model your time series and then you work with the model because it's easier and you have parameters that are useful for your downstream uh, analyses. Um, and then I use these parameters to carry out the analysis. This involved computing directed functional connectivity into and out of each region. Um, and this is essentially explored with the Granger causal metric. And then I performed the dynamical independence or dependence analysis that you've already seen. And I compute uh, the group level differences between conditions. So to evaluate this kind of utility of directed functional connectivity, I compared it to the mutual information, which measures undirected functional connectivity. And what you are seeing here are the normalized effect sizes for sleep stages compared to the weight condition. So normalized because they're normalized between negative one and one. Um, and blue indicates regions with lower undirected or directed functional connectivity compared to wake, while red shows regions with higher connectivity. So as you can probably see, the undirected functional connectivity um, compared to wake, there is very little differentiation between the sleep stages. And there is a kind of just general decrease. You might not even be able to see it on the projector where it gets more and more decreased as you go further into the stages of sleep. Um, however, if you kind of look at that second row, um, which shows the information flow into each region from the rest of the system, and the third row, which shows information flow out of each region to the rest of the system, something fascinating starts to emerge. There's a gradual decrease in information flow into the posterior and temporal regions as we move through the sleep stages and we see that in the information flow into there is a general increase in this same area so i found this quite interesting and i kind of then asked the question is there anything about this that's kind of band specific right so this is just a temporal domain where i kind of integrate over all of the frequency domains. So what I did is I broke it up. I broke the data up into frequencies of interest. So when we break this down into four frequency bands in terms of undirected functional connectivity, we don't see much change overall. The only noticeable shift is a more pronounced decrease in connectivity compared to wakefulness. And that's kind of all, all I get from it. So as you go deeper into sleep, and this includes REM as well. So that that's interesting, but that's about it. But when we focus on the information flow into each region, that's the central panel, um, there are frequency specific patterns. And I kind of hope that you can see some of this. There is a clear decrease in the information flow into the posterior and temporal regions in the alpha and beta bands. However, kind of when we look at delta and theta, we actually see an increase in some of the posterior regions. This is fascinating for me because I, I kind of think that um, this suggests that while information inflow to the posterior hot zone decreases in beta and alpha, it kind of, it may actually increase or become more differentiated in delta and theta. And this might point to a mechanism where delta and theta serve as carriers of information during sleep. As for the information outflow from each region, 
we don't see anything that kind of jumps out right away. So I think that there's only like kind of an inversion. There seems to be some increase of outflow where there is a decrease of inflow, um, which makes sense. But other than that, there is not too much. So even though we are seeing something interesting here, what I want to do is still distinguish slightly the states um, slightly more. And I kind of don't think I can do this on a pairwise scale. So this slide is quite dense, but you've seen these guys before. So maybe I will just like kind of focus on this. The whole point is that what you are seeing is the same analysis we kind of did with the anesthetic conditions, but applied across pairwise comparisons of each sleep stage against the other. So what stands out is that N2 and N3 are the most emergent stages. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so they're the most emergent stages followed by REM, N1 and wake. But when we compare this with anesthetic conditions, we also see that the deepest anesthetics are the most emergent. I do the same idea with the structure, dynamical structure across macroscopic variables. And I show these numbers are the similarity. So the smaller the number, the more similar, the larger the number, the less similar. We see that the structure across these higher order scales between wake and REM is the most similar, especially when we look at the lower scales of higher order scales. And N1 with all of the conditions is the most different in structure. To me, this is fascinating because N1 is usually like uh, thrown out when we do sleep research because it's so messy. But here we're seeing a distinct in emergence as a quantity and in the dynamical structure. Anyway, I kind of also show here at the end that there is a decrease of, uh, there is an increase of similarity. So the higher scale you go, and I show here that this increase of similarity is driven by noise as you go higher in the uh, spatial scales. And that's about it. I will summarize, but we've already spoken, and I'd love to thank my amazing team who put up with my crazy ideas. Can't be done without them. And that's it. Thanks a lot.